So today we're going to talk about vital signs. Uh, the collection of basic vital signs is standard before performing most cardiovascular diagnostic procedures. So vital signs would also be monitored anytime uh, the patient reports a change in his or her status or any time before administration of medication. So like in the cath lab, for instance, if um, we are going to give conscious sedation, you always have to have a set of uh, basic vital signs before you would give that medication, which includes blood pressure, heart rate, and respirations. So vital signs to be assessed in this class are heart rate, and it's measured in beats per minute. Temperature measured in Fahrenheit, respiratory rate is measured in times per minute, and then blood pressure is measured in millimeters of mercury. So the heart rate is, is the pulse, and as the heart beats, blood is pumped in a pulsating manner through the arteries. This results in a throb or pulsation of the artery. In the absence of peripheral disease, the heart rate reflects uh, the speed of ventricular contraction and the quality of ejection of blood from the left ventricle. So the pulse is a rapid and efficient way to assess cardiovascular function. So if you need um, to assess a patient very quickly, if their, if their mental status or, or their hemodynamic status is going down um, quickly, you can take their pulse just to get that um, initial assessment. When you assess a patient for their pulse rate, you should also feel for the pulse amplitude, the strength of the pulse, and the pulse rhythm, if it's regular or irregular. The heart rate is the number of times the ventricle contracts in a minute. So normal heart rate for the adult patient is 60 to 100 beats per minute at rest. So if someone has a heart rate less than 60 beats per minute, we call that bradycardia. So that's a slow heart rate. And again, that's less than 60 beats per minute. Now you might have athletes, a lot of runners, marathon runners, they have a normal heart rate that is below 60. You know, so you want to check with the patient. And also some patients who take certain medications, they, that tends to lower their heart rate below 60 beats per minute. So you might have some patients in the 40s or 50s, but you have to check with them because sometimes that's normal for the patient. And then if someone has a heart rate greater than 100 beats per minute at rest, we, we say that that patient is tachycardic, their tachycardia. So the pulse quality, um, we look at the rhythm. Is the pulse regular or does it skip beats? And then the regularity of the rhythm, if it's regular, the pulse is regular and consistent. If it's regular, irregular, then you have a regularly occurring skipped beat. So you might have pulse and then it skips a beat, pulse and then it skips a beat. And then if it's irregular, then it's inconsistent. Uh, the amplitude of the pulse, which is the force, you can have a hyperkinetic pulse, which is a strong, forceful pulse with a high amplitude, so it has strong force and high cardiac output, or you have a hypo kinetic pulse, which is a weak and slow pulse, and that's found in low cardiac output states. So when you take the pulse, you locate the radial pulse. The radial artery is located on the thumb or radial side of the wrist right here in this picture. You should always have a stopwatch or a watch with a second hand. Wash your hands before you touch the patient. Explain what you're about to do. And if the patient is standing, have them sit in a resting position. Place the tip of your index finger and your middle finger um, over the patient's radial artery, as, as shown here in this picture. Apply light pressure to feel the beat of the pulse, because you want to make sure you don't push too hard. Sometimes um, we tend to push too hard, and then we occlude the pulse, and you don't feel anything. So check to feel if the pulse is regular or irregular, and count the number of impulses you feel in the arterial area. And we typically do this for 10 seconds, and then you multiply by 6, or 15 seconds and multiply by 4. Obviously, the longer you count, the more accurate it's going to be. So I recommend that, that you guys in lab that you do 15 seconds and then multiply by 4.
So respirations is the next vital sign. And the main purpose of respiration is to supply the cells of the body with oxygen and rid the body of excess carbon dioxide. So when respirations are inefficient, carbon dioxide accumulates in the bloodstream and, and the patients tend to get a dusky blue or gray color, which we call cyanosis. So this is just some common terminology here. Um, this do does show up on your um, quiz, your vital signs quiz, where you have to match these terms. So the first one is respiration, and that's the cycle of one inhalation and one exhalation. Apnea is absence of respiration. Epnea is normal breathing. Dyspnea is difficulty or labored breathing. Tachypnea is rapid, shallow breathing. Orthopnea is shortness of breath when the patient lies flat. And then Shine-Stokes syndrome is periods of shortness of breath followed by periods of not breathing. And then Rails is moist respirations. And we would listen to that with our stethoscope. So when we count respirations, um, you observe the number of times the chest rises and falls for one minute. So the chest rises and then falls, that counts as one. Um, so it's one inhalation, one exhalation. So it, this should be done while you're taking the patient's pulse, which is difficult at first. So you're not expected to do that in lab. Um, I tell the students to take the pulse first, get that taken care of, and then just keep your fingers on the radial artery and act like you're still taking the pulse while you're counting the respirations. Because you don't want the patient to be aware that you're counting his or her respirations because then we tend to um, try to control our breathing. So normal respiratory rate is 12 to 24 respirations per minute. If it's greater than 25, it's accelerated. If it's less than 12, it's too slow. So anytime you have an abnormal uh, vital sign, we report that to the physician. Um, temperature is the measurement of body heat. It's the balance between heat produced and heat lost, and your temperature should be constant. Usually varies between one to three degrees Fahrenheit. Body temperature is the lowest in the morning and rises in the afternoon and evening. So I have a picture up here. This is a temporal, um, device to take a patient's temperature, which is what most hospitals are using. And then here's a tympanic device which goes in the ear canal. And then, of course, by mouth you can take the temperature. And then this slide just shows um, some causes of increased body temper temperature and then some causes of decreased body temperature. This is just an FYI slide. So hypothermia is a drop in rectal temperature below 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Hyperthermia is an increase in the rectal body temperature to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if a patient has a fever, uh, it's typically when it's above 101 degrees. I know a lot of times we uh, say that 99 degrees or 100 degrees is a low-grade fever, but that's really um, no such thing. It's 101 degrees or higher is a fever. And then this is just a conversion of temperatures down here from Fahrenheit to Celsius and Celsius to Fahrenheit. Again, you do not need to know this. Uh, it is just there for FYI. The last vital sign is blood pressure. And the actual definition of blood pressure is the arterial blood pressure is a measure of the lateral force unit area of a vascular wall. So in other words, when the heart beats, it pumps blood to the arteries and creates pressure in them. Blood pressure is measured in millimeters per mercury, and it's always an improper fraction. So an example is 100 over 76 millimeters of mercury. Normal blood pressure falls within a range. It's not a set number, and it does change minute to minute. It changes with change in posture, sleeping, or exercise. So according to American Heart Association, normal blood pressure for an adult should be 120 over 80. Blood pressure between 120 to 139 over 80 to 89 is considered prehypertensive. And blood pressure 140 over 90 or higher is considered hypertension. So we say systolic 90 to 139 
diastolic 60 to 89. So on the other end of it too, you do not want blood pressure to drop below 90 over 60. But um, again, some patients, their blood pressure, it, that's normal for them that it's 90 over 60. So you, again, you just want to talk with your patient and check with them if that's a normal vital sign for them. Uh, this is a cat, uh, chart from the American Heart Association. Uh, again, it just shows normal blood pressure less than 120, systolic less than 80, diastolic, prehypertensive 120 to 139, diastolic 80 to 89 and then high they they actually break down the hypertension into uh, two stages and then the last one here is hypertensive crisis if it's above 180 over 110 now these next two slides are two equations and these do show up on your quiz first one here is mean pressure so to find the mean pressure you take two diastolic plus one systolic divided by three. So I have an example of 140 over 60. So 60 plus 60 plus 140 equals 260 and then you divide it by three and you get a mean pressure of 87 millimeters of mercury. The next one is the pulse pressure which is, is pretty simple. You just take systole minus diastole. So 140 minus 60 equals 80 millimeters of mercury and that's the pulse pressure. And then hypertension here, this is just uh, the abbreviation, it's capital HTN and that's sustained or intermittent high blood pressure in, in diastole or systole. It is important to make note that um, for a patient to be classified as hypertensive it does not need to be high in systolic and diastolic it could just be high or elevated in systole and your diastolic number might be all right and vice versa and the same thing with a patient that's hypotensive that's going to be sustained or intermittent low blood pressure so blood pressure equipment is this figmo manometer um, and that's this picture right here and it just breaks it down as to sphygmo refers to pulse mano refers to pressure and meter refers to measure. So we have this Figmo manometer and the stethoscope. We wash our hands, we introduce ourselves to the patient, check the patient ID, let them know um, what you're going to be doing. We have the patient um, sit down with their arm palm side up on a firm surface and roll up the patient's sleeve if you can. I mean if you have on a thin shirt or a thin sweater they usually can wrap the cuff around that and it's fine but you should try to get the patient's arm out of their clothing. So we wrap the cuff around the patient's arm and there is an arrow or marker on the cuff labeled artery so you want to place that directly over the patient's brachial artery which is located in the crease of the elbow and that label side should be facing you. Wrap the cuff around the patient's arm above the elbow. The lower edge of the cuff should be one to two inches above the bend of the elbow. It should be comfortable, not too tight, not too loose. You should be able to snugly or put your finger underneath um, that edge of the cuff so it's not too tight. So we put the cuff on the patient and now we're going to check for the radial artery. So we're going to keep the index finger of your non-dominant hand over the vessel to feel the arterial pulse. We're going to tighten the thumb screw of the blood pressure cuff and you're going to begin to slowly inflate the cuff while you're palpating the radial artery. While you're inflating the cuff you're going to feel the radial artery stop pulsating and this is known as the palpatory systolic pulse. So you just want to be watching the meter and note when that stops. So if I was inflating the cuff and I felt the radial pulse stop beating at 120, you just want to make mental note of that number and then continue to inflate the cuff another 20 millimeters of mercury after you notice the pulse stop and then you deflate the cuff. Now this is the textbook way to take a blood pressure and I, I think if I would ask the class most people would say that 
no one has ever taken their blood pressure this way. So in lab when we practice this and I demonstrate it, um, I will have you do it this way just a few times just to get the hang of it, but you, you don't have to test out this way when you take the blood pressure. Um, the reason that we do this, um, palpate the radial artery and inflate the cuff because you do not have to inflate the cuff to 200 for everyone. Um, you know, like they do in the doctor's office. So for some patients, like I said, about the 120, you might inflate the cuff to 120 and, and know that for this patient, you only have to inflate it to 140 and you don't have to hurt the patient's arm by inflating it to 200. So once we get that number and we deflate the cuff, you're gonna place the stethoscope in your ears. If you don't have your own stethoscope, make sure you clean um, the earpieces here and the diaphragm of the of the stethoscope with an alcohol wipe. Place the diaphragm right here directly over the brachial artery. Tighten the thumb screw of the blood pressure cuff and inflate the cuff to the number you recorded previously. Hold the stethoscope in place and slowly deflate the cuff. So this is done by turning the thumb screw counterclockwise. And then listen for the first beat. When you hear that first heartbeat, that's the systolic blood pressure. Continue to release the air slowly, and then you'll hear the sound change to a muffled or dull beat, and this is the diastolic pressure. Release all the air from the cuff, and then record your findings for your blood pressure, and remove the stethoscope from your ears. The big thing is to remember to deflate the cuff. A lot of people forget to do that. Now this is a lot to remember, and and like I said, I will demonstrate this in class and we'll go over these notes again when we're in lab practicing. And then lastly, always ask the patient if it's okay to use the right or left arm for blood pressure. Um, some patients have an AV fistula, some patients had lymph node surgery, and if they have an IV in, in their right arm, then you don't want to take it in their right arm. So use opposite arm if they have any, any of the above that I just mentioned. So, and then these last two slides, you guys can read through these, but this is just FYI, just so you know what an AV fistula is and um, what it is used for, it's used for dialysis and why you can't take a blood pressure if somebody has an AV fistula. And then about patients who had, um, if they had a mastectomy and had lymph node removes, removed or if they just had lymph node surgery as to why you're not supposed to use that arm. So you guys can just read through. Um, those two slides. Thank you.